In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Now I know we went through this last night, but uh, last night I had to go ahead and uh, make sure everyone had been evangelized. So we'll just uh, start here because also this was not able to get on the internet and the people on the internet would probably uh, like to keep going verse by verse and since they didn't get this we'll go over it again and then keep going 828 when he came to the other side to the region of the Gadarenes two demon possessed men coming from the tombs met him they were extremely violent so that no one was able to pass by that way when demon possession occurs, along with it, there is an abnormal strength. And they were able to keep anyone from passing in that area. Someone would pass in that area, and they would just, uh, well, the demons act psychotic. So they would just grab them and just throw them. Extreme power. And that's what demon-possessed people usually have is a, a, a abnormal strength. Then in 829, they cried out, that is the demons, Son of God, leave us alone. So there, is, there are people standing around the Lord Jesus Christ and they suddenly see these demon-possessed men calling him the Son of God. So it should have made them think for a little bit. Wow, he must be the Son of God. These demons recognize him as the Son of God. Maybe I should. So they cried out, Son of God, leave us alone. Have you come here to torment us before the time? And so they were uh, kind of being insulting to our Lord, and they are about to do something that they think will inhibit the Lord's ministry. And they do that by uh, asking the Lord to send them into pigs. A large herd of pigs was feeding some distance from them. And we have to remember that pigs were outlawed during those times. And the Jews still today, they don't eat bacon, they don't eat ham, they don't eat anything related to pigs, and neither do the Muslims. They consider the pig a dirty animal. And they did at that time under the Mosaic Law because of a certain... The, the health codes that they had to follow. Now today we don't have to follow these health codes because we're under a different system and our medical technology has gone so far that well, we don't even have to uh, worry about eating bacon unless you do it in excess. If you eat too much bacon or too much uh, pig's meat, you might get gout or you might get uh, something else or you might clog your arteries. And this was the reason why the Jews couldn't eat it. Because there was a health code for them. There's not one for us. Now, we have to have common sense about our health, but uh, there's no spiritual attachment to it. So a large herd of pigs was feeding some distance from them. Then the demons asked him, If you drive us out, send us in to that herd of pigs. See, the, the demons thought they could trip up our Lord because they knew that if they could go into the pigs and drown the pigs that the pigs would, uh, well, they would uh, cause an uproar because the pigs uh, illustrated money. It was their way to make money. And it was the black market because it was illegal. And they would go and sell bacon and ham and all of those things to the Jews who didn't care about the law. And they would buy it and eat it. And they were making a lot of money because when you outlaw something, the price of it skyrockets. And in the same way, we have drug dealers today. They've outlawed marijuana. Well, people who deal in marijuana make a lot of money. It's illegal. It's undoctrinal as well. And there is nothing in the Bible that says we have a right to smoke weed. There's, in fact, there's stuff in the Bible that says do not do it. And the Greek word is pharmakeia. And it's talking about an abuse of drugs. 
And if you abuse drugs, you destroy your life. You destroy your ability to even think eventually if you do it over an extended period of time. And I gave you the example of Ozzy Osbourne. He's a wealthy man whose brain is fried. And if you go in that direction, it doesn't matter uh, what you achieve in life. If you get hooked on drugs, you'll destroy it. You might lose everything. And I've seen it happen in not just a few families, but in, in just about every family I know, there's someone who's gotten addicted to drugs. A terrible thing. It was actually something that uh, the communist conspirators introduced to this country in the 1960s. And they said if we could get, just get the United States hooked on drugs in the same way that uh, England got China hooked on drugs, then they'll fall all apart. And do you know Kung Fu? Do you know where Kung Fu really comes from? You see, the British took over China. And then while they were there, the British realized they could make a quick profit if they would just sell heroin to all the Chinese. And all the Chinese, most of them, not all of them, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but a great majority of the Chinese got hooked on heroin and uh, other things. Opium, it was opium. And so uh, they would do this opium and then they would get hot-headed and say, we're going to take back our country. You know how they would do it? Kung Fu. But they, the Kung Fu developed because they were high and they thought that their chua, they thought that all of that stuff could stop British bullets and British tanks. And they found out very quickly that it couldn't. But it's still brought down today to us. Now, there is a true system of Kung Fu. If you were to go to a, a Kung Fu master today and learn it, well, they've uh, brought it down to a science in which they can tell you where to hit somebody, where it'll really hurt them or knock them out. And I've seen it on television where they just one hit and out they go. But it all originated from a bunch of hogwash. It all started with the uh, dope heads thinking they could stop the British Army, and they couldn't. And so don't get involved in that stuff. But the point is from here is they were dealing with an illicit type of food. We don't have illicit food today. We have illicit drugs. But then they had illicit food and uh, pig's food or pork or bacon or any ham. All of those things were illicit. And they were selling them in the black market and making a ton of money. So when the herdsmen saw what our Lord had done, because he said in 8.32, and he said, Go! So they came out and went into the pigs. Then the herd rushed over the cliff into the sea, and they drowned in the water. Well, this was the demons figuring, Hey, look, we'll trap our Lord. He thinks he's going to reach these people? We'll just take all their money and dump it in the sea. And when they're in the sea, and all that money drowns, well, they won't like our Lord, but they wouldn't have liked him anyway. See, that they were negative, and it doesn't matter the circumstance. The demons had the, their eyes on the wrong thing. They had their eyes on, well, if I can offend them in some way, they'll run away. They would have been offended by something else anyway. And the demons uh, really are, these types of demons were rather stupid, so they really didn't understand uh, the human volition as it were and so they would have rejected our Lord's ministry anyway so this just fulfills what uh, God wanted them to fulfill otherwise he wouldn't have let it happen so the herdsmen ran off went into town and told everything that had happened to the men who had been demon possessed well then all the people in the black market got together and said we can't allow this to happen anymore we must go up to the Lord and say, well, they didn't recognize him as Lord, but they said, we must go up to this strange man who has all this power and tell him to please leave. And they were polite about it. They didn't say, leave you SOB. They said, please leave us. They wanted their money and they didn't care about the gospel. So in 834, then the entire town came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave, begged him. And they were about on their knees. They were frightened by him, first of all. And all those mafia people you see on television, you think they're tough? No, they're frightened. They're scared. And any time a greater violence comes towards them, they take off running. 
You see, they act tough when they got a gun in their hand. And they act tough when they confront somebody who is uh, weak. And they always take control of the weak. But if they ever come in confrontation with someone who is strong, someone who actually has the power to just annihilate them, they cower in fear. Those mafia people are not to be admired. And I know the American culture and American movies admire the mafia people. And they make them out to be great tough guys, great Brutus type people who can just go out and be intimidating to everyone. Well, they found out right here by the fact that they begged the Lord. What this indicates is the Lord was someone who would not be intimidated. No one could intimidate our Lord. Why would they? He had angels watching after him. We do too. They're called guardian angels. And he had the word of God in his soul and he knew he had a mission and he knew that these mafia type people wouldn't bother him. So when a greater violence or someone who was capable of a greater violence comes against uh, another force, they get scared. And that's the way the Arabs are. Those people we're fighting today, remember when we first started bombing Iraq, you might not remember it. We had Tariq Aziz and all of the uh, people come out and they talked a big fight. And they said, we will have the sword slaughter the Americans. And then the, the news person would say, well, we just heard uh, Marines are coming into the uh, Baghdad International Airport. And they would say, that hasn't happened. We're slaughtering those people. A bunch of hot air. And then when we take them over and the violence is right there, where do they go? They hide in a hole. They don't even try to martyr themselves. They're scared. And they get in a hole and they put a little fan in there until they come and get caught. And then when they're caught, they're shaking in fear. But then they try to act tough again. Hey, I am the president of Iraq. Not anymore. We kicked you out, dummy. But see, they're, they're tough guys. They think they're tough. But any time a greater force comes along, they cower in fear. Well, this man had gotten up before the war had started, that is Saddam Hussein, and told all his people, you grab up the sword, I'll grab up the sword with you, and we will ram it through the Americans, and we will kill the Americans. And he charged them all up, and they all said the same thing because they were scared of him. And they knew that if they didn't go along with him, well, he would kill them. So it was all fear, based on fear, and so was his life. Because once we started going in there and he met a power greater than he was, he shrunk away in fear and went into a little hole. How humiliating. But he's still arrogant today. And he thinks he's going to get away with all of the things that he's done and he's not. His own people are going to end up hanging him. And these people were the same way. They were concerned with power. They were concerned with money. But they were not concerned with the gospel. And they would never dare come up to the Lord and tell him how to conduct his business. They didn't go up to the Lord and say, leave now or we'll kill you. Well, they about got on their beg, on their knees and they begged and they said, Lord, leave us. But they didn't say Lord. They didn't recognize him as that. But they went up to him and said, please leave us alone. They were scared. They had never seen anything like that happen before. So after all this occurred, he's going to move on and we're going to have the ministry of the king. And this is what we can uh, title chapter 9. Chapter 9 is the ministry of the king, the king of the Jews, the king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And he first starts out with the message to the paralytic. After boarding the ship, he, ca he crossed back to the other side and came to his own town. His own town at this time would be that of Capernaum. Capernaum is C-A-P-E-R-N-A-U-M, and that's where our Lord went. Then in 9-2, all of a sudden, four men brought to him a paralytic. This paralytic was a believer. He was lying on a stretcher. And when Jesus saw their faith, that would be their faith rest drill. Now, remember, he's seeing the faith rest drill of the ones who are bringing the paralytic. The paralytic is crippled with guilt. The paralytic 
The man who is crippled and can't move feels sorry for himself. He feels guilty about something that he's done. And he doesn't have enough faith to believe that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross for all of that and that he is forgiven. And he doesn't believe it. So he feels guilty. And so he talks to his four buddies and says, Take me to see the Lord. I want to see the Lord. And his four buddies have probably been telling him, Look, you're forgiven. You're saved. Why are you worried about it? But the four men take him to Jesus. And because of their faith, Jesus says to the paralytic, And right here, he's about to teach the paralytic eternal security. He's about to teach him something related to the fact that you cannot lose your salvation. So he says to him, and your translation might say, son. Now, son, if if, uh, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, son, how you doing? It's usually... a something that is, well, it's a just part of conversation in which people are being nice to each other. In this case, in the Aramaic and in the Greek, he's really calling him a dumb kid. Son, little child, dumb kid. So uh, Jesus Christ is amidst the crowd. He's just heard what's going on. The crowd doesn't really know what's going on. The only thing they see Jesus do is uh, look at this crippled man and say, dumb kid, very tough. Our Lord was, always was, except on a few occasions he he would be soft. He was soft when he needed to be soft, and he was tough when he needed to be tough. So he says, dumb kid. So Jesus Christ insults a paralytic to get his point across. Then he, this is what he says in entirety. Dumb kid, have confidence. Your sins are canceled. The sins were canceled. You see, he thought that he still had to worry about those sins he had committed. But he believed in Christ. Those sins were canceled. He was still worried about them, though. And the same holds true for post-salvation sins. If you walk around with a guilt complex, you're not impressing God. If you walk around because you've done something wrong and you hang your head in shame and say, I've just, I've just disappointed God, You must think highly of yourself. You cannot disappoint God. God has always been happy. God knew in eternity past that you would be a screwball and screw up in that way. And he's made provision for us as believers. 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful. He'll do it every time. And just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So guilt is not part of the spiritual life. Now, some pastors around here and around the country might tell you you must feel sorry for your sins, but that's antithetical to what the Word of God says. It's antithetical to what Jesus told to this paralytic. Jesus was tough, and he said, Dumb kid, your sins have been canceled. They've been forgiven. It's all over. He was a baby believer, but our Lord was tough with the baby believer because he needed to hear these words. And then our Lord continues. Now, right now, he might be feeling pretty bad, but our Lord's about to do something that's going to make him feel very good because then he says, have confidence, your sins are canceled. And then some of the experts in the law thought, this one slanders or this one blasphemes. You see, they're all getting around now saying, this man just said that this guy's sins are forgiven. Who is he to say anyone's sins are forgiven? Who is this guy? He must think he is something special. And they pointed at him and said, look at, well, they didn't point at him. They were talking amongst themselves, being very quiet about it. Jesus knew about it because he's the son of God. And he had a lot of doctrine so that in his humanity, he had a lot of discernment. So he was able to see what was going on. And he saw these people and he knew that they were thinking, hey, this man uh, he, how, who does he think he is forgiving people's sins? He is an arrogant SOB. He was the son of God. He was perfect. And he had never sinned. And he had perfection. And yet these people wanted to gossip about perfection. And then the Lord calls them on it. And they don't like that. When you're called on something, you really bristle at it. So, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, you see, they think they're being private about it. 
But now, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says, well, he stares them right in the eye, and he says to them, why do you think evil in your hearts? He caught them. And they, wouldn't, they weren't about to admit that they had been caught, but he caught them, and they reacted to it. And they reacted now, and they'll react later, and they'll react and react, and their reaction's going to build up so big that finally they're going to hate him so much they're going to murder him. Right now they, they hate him enough to gossip, and then it's going to build up more and more and more. And then when they see how popular he is, they're just going to grind their teeth until finally they're going to want him to hang on a cross. And there'll be a murderer up there. And they'll let the murderer go free. But hang the perfect man. Because he told them the truth. And they didn't like the truth. Well, so what? It's the truth. Some of us, and not just any of us here, I'm talking about around the whole country. Some of us need to realize that the truth hurts. It hurt them. It hurts us. It hurts me. When I come across a passage that says something, that, and I realize I've been wrong in this area, it hurts. But you don't react to it and say, uh, bye-bye. What you say is, yes, I need to change. So... This is what uh, Jesus did, and he knew their thoughts. And then he went on to say, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say stand up and walk? What actually would be easier for our Lord would be to say stand up and walk, because from uh, to, to perform a miracle is very easy for our Lord. But forgiveness of sins, guess what? If you don't believe in Christ... Jesus Christ cannot forgive you. If you go through your whole life as an unbeliever and, uh, and you've never believed in Christ, Jesus Christ never does forgive you. He was judged for those sins, but he never did forgive those sins. So and even though Jesus Christ would give just about everything so that you would believe in him, he can't do it. If you don't believe it, he leaves you alone in freedom. And he says, all right, your sins are not forgiven. So it's harder to forgive sins. But the legalists, the scribes, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, they thought it would be harder to perform a miracle. So he's trapping them here. He's trapping them in their ignorance of the word of God because he asked them this. He says, says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and walk? Well, they think it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. But in fact, it's easier to say stand up and walk. So what happens is, he makes this man stand up and walk. And in 9.6 it says, But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your stretcher, and go home. And immediately, this crippled man stood up, grabbed his stretcher, and went home. And he probably uh, danced all the way home, or skipped all the way home. But he was excited. I mean, the first time he's ever been able to walk for a while. We don't know how long, but uh, the illness is now over. The pain is now over, and he's excited, and he's skipping home. And now all of these religious people are going to have to eat their words because they thought to themselves, it would be harder to say for him to get up and walk. And they never thought for a moment that Jesus would be able to make this man stand up and walk. And when he did, and when all their students saw it, there were students of them religious people there. And when they saw they became jealous. And they, they, were, too, they were self-absorbed. They were arrogant. They were so concerned with themselves, it didn't shock them. What they should have done is said, well, I'll be, this must be the Son of God. And they should have came to a change of mind. But instead, they became even more bitter and said, ooh. And then they started to uh, think to themselves, this man must have the power of Beelzebub, of Satan. Because surely we're greater than this man who hangs out with prostitutes. 
But they weren't. He's the Son of God. And then so in 9, 6, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth. You see, during this whole time, they had been rejecting our Lord's authority because he was so tough, because he did get in their faces, because he did walk up to them while they were in front of him sitting and while he was preaching. And he did say to them, you hypocrites, you are going to hell. And he said that and it offended them. And they didn't like it one bit. And because he said these things, they rejected his authority. And then what does he do? He brings out the fact that he has authority. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your stretcher, and go home. What he did by doing that was establish authority. Before, the scribes, the Pharisees, and hypocrites were free to gossip and malign and rip apart our Lord all they wanted to. But once that occurred and everybody around saw it happen, well, they recognized authority for once. You see, the people in Israel had a problem with authority, just like most people in the United States have a problem with authority. And any time somebody in authority offends you, you've got to make an issue out of it. And I'm not talking simply about myself, and, and don't think of it that way. I'm talking about everything. Remember the last time you were pulled over by a police officer. Did you say, yes, sir, yes, sir? Well, if you did, you have authority orientation. But if you thought to yourself, this jerk must think he's something pulling me over, well, you broke the law. You deserved it. You deserve to be pulled over. But most people get mad at the police officer. And they think they call him a pig. This pig pulled me over. He's not a pig. He's a man in authority. And as Christians, don't you ever call a police officer a pig. They're people in authority. And we learn this from Romans. It's in the book of Romans where it talks about how we must submit to the authority of the land. And the police officers are out there for good, not for bad. You see, there was one time, well, this is a joke. I think it's a joke. It may have really happened. But one time in New York City, a whole bunch of people got together protesting against the police. And they were walking around saying, F the police, F this, F that, and F the police. And going up and down the street. And then, well, suddenly, uh, it started to get a bit more violent. And some of the people were getting really into it. F the police, F the police. And then uh, all on the side here, a brawl broke out and people started fighting. And then eventually everybody was getting beat up and there was a huge brawl all across the city. And you know what that crowd said? Where's the police? <laughs> They're here for our good. And sometimes they might be wrong having sin natures, and they might be. I've had encounters with police officers who thought that the, they weren't even police officers. They were rent-a-cops, and they thought they were the, uh, the greatest thing that had ever come. But they're still the authority. And even when authority does you wrong, they're still the authority. And it happened to the Apostle Paul several times. How many times did Apostle Paul go to jail? Did he ever make a big stink of it? No, he just constantly taught doctrine. And, and he knew the law of Rome, so one time he just got fed up with it all and said, I appeal to Caesar. He got sick of being arrested all the time for no reason. And so finally, uh, he, had, he was in the wrong this time, by the way. He went to Jerusalem when God told him not to, and he was in the wrong. So he gets arrested, and he's about by this time he, he's tired of it. And if he had just let it go, he would have been fine. But God wanted him in Rome. And so he was frustrated. He wasn't in sin. He was just a bit frustrated. And he says, I appeal to Caesar. And he could do that as a Roman citizen. And so they thought to themselves, well, we were about to let you go, but since you appealed, we're taking you to Rome. Well, that was where he was supposed to be to start with. And that's where he ended up. So don't ever uh, come down on the police officer. We have to have authority in a country. And if more people respected the police officer, there would be a lot less crime. But instead, you think you can run him down because uh, you can call him a pig or something else. No. 
So they had a problem with authority. We see that from 9.6. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. Everybody had been questioning our Lord's authority throughout his ministry. And so uh, and God the Father knew it would be necessary for him to uh, be able to do some miracles so that he could show his authority. So that he could uh, just uh, go ahead and uh, make some crippled man stand up and walk. And then he's saying, look, I have authority now. You need to respect my authority. And then in 9-7, and he got up and went home. Now, there's no mention here of him picking up his stretcher. Now, in other uh, books, such as uh, Luke and the others, it talks about the same paralytic man. And that same paralytic man is described as picking up the stretcher and going home. But here it just says, and he got up and went home. And it's talking about the same paralytic in the other passages. And, well, he just got up and went home. It was, it, Matthew was uh, more impressed with the fact that he just got up and went home. And he probably did take his stretcher. So I'm not going to make any more points out of that except to say this, that possibly God the Holy Spirit told Levi, Matthew, the tax collector, when he was writing this, he told him, uh, omit the fact that he picked up his stretcher. And he just says, and he got up and went home. Well, he forgot about his sins is what it's saying. He disregarded his sins. He's not going to pick up the stretcher. He's not going to pick up those old things. Even though he did, and we know he did from the other passages, Matthew leaves it out for a reason. And he's saying, look, he forgot about his sins. He disregarded his sins. He got up and went home. I know it might be a little hard to understand. The stretcher uh, represented uh, him holding on to his sins him holding on to the fact that he was a sinner. Well, we all are. And it re represented him feeling guilty. And it represented him, uh, well, it just represented uh, he was carrying the garbage with him. And when Matthew says, and he went up, when he got up and he went home, what Matthew's indicating is that uh, he forgot about his sins. He disregarded them, and there's a book that, or a pamphlet that I wrote, name it, and disregard it. Well, what happened when the Lord uh, told him, uh, you're forgiven? Well, he disregarded it. He stopped worrying about it. And we have a tendency to name our sins and then feel guilty all day and then think about it later. And, and, and then when we think about it later, we go right back into sin because of guilt. And that's what this paralytic was doing. But this indicates that he stopped doing that. Once he went to the Lord and once the Lord assured him, your sins are forgiven, well, he just got up and went home. Didn't even hang around anymore. He got his answer. And that's what it's saying. Although if you want to know, did he really pick up his stretcher? Yes, he did. He picked it up and took it home. But uh, God the Holy Spirit directed Matthew in this way so that uh, we could see that he had disregarded his sins. Now in 9.8, when the crowd saw this, they were afraid. They actually started to respect someone who they'd been talking about a lot, the Lord. And when the crowd saw this, they were afraid and honored God who had given such authority to men. Well, we see that... Uh, they suddenly recognize authority. But before this, they didn't recognize it. They didn't know it. And they didn't know that our Lord had authority on the earth. They looked at him as just another man. And they looked at him and they said, uh, what's this guy know? Uh, he gets up and says he can forgive sin. Who among us is able to forgive sin? It would be a legitimate question. I mean, you wouldn't just, uh, if you had any sense about you, you just wouldn't... Uh, automatically say, wow, and, uh, and not unless you are extremely positive to start off with. Most people would be a bit cynical to start off with. It's the first time it's happened in a long, long time. I mean, it's the Lord Jesus Christ incarnate. Now, if you'd known scripture about it and you'd known all the signs that would come along with it, you would have already known it like the disciples. But some of these people were skeptical. Skept skeptical. And it's uh, that's all right. But then after... After this, uh, after he showed his authority, their skepticism went away very quickly. 
And so they became afraid because they remembered all the bad things they had said and now they think, ooh, he really might be the Son of God. I better change my mind. And a lot of them did and a lot of them were saved. And now we have our Lord's ministry to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, beginning in chapter 9, verse 9. Now this is something that would irritate people today. This is something that would irritate a lot of legalists today. And if our Lord Jesus Christ were on the earth today, and he were, let's, say, let's say he went down uh, Whitner Street out here, I don't know, a couple blocks down where the prostitutes are. I saw a couple of them. And let's say he went down there and he went into one of their homes and sat down, relaxed, ate with them, ate with the prostitutes who were there. And let's say he had dinner with them and had an adult beverage with them. What would all of, well, what would most people around here say about that? I mean, here's some man saying, I'm the son of God. And he walks down West Whitner Street, goes into a house of ill repute, which would be a, a place where prostitutes would go, and he reclines there and eats with them and talks with them. What would they say about him? They would say, this man can't be the son of God. I saw him at 11 o'clock last night walking amongst the prostitutes. You know what he's up to. And he calls himself the son of God. They, they would have ripped him to shreds. And they did. And they hung him on a cross. But he had a ministry. And his ministry was to everyone. Prostitutes and all. You see their sins are no worse than our sins of mental attitude sins. In fact they're not as bad as our mental attitude sins. And they are sins. And to be a prostitute would be a terrible uh, plight in life. And you'll probably end up dying young of some venereal disease. And it would be a terrible life to live. But these people had no hope. So they went to the Lord. They wanted an answer. All the religious people never gave them an answer. All the religious people looked down their noses at them. All the religious people scoffed at them. And if they had walked into a synagogue, they would have chewed them out and said, Nobody like this deserves to be in this temple. Only the holy people like me deserve to be in this temple. And so they would always be looked down on and frowned upon. So they went to Jesus for an answer. It's the only place they could go, only place anybody can go. <clears throat> but we start off first with the tax collector before we get to the prostitutes. And in 9.9 it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew. That would be Matthew the Levi, the author of this book. Sitting at the tax booth. And our Lord said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Matthew, the Levi. And all the Lord did, he, he walked up to the tax booth. Now you have to remember it was a job. He had a job, a tax collector. And that job was, a, even though the Israelites hated him, it was a very high paying job. And in fact, most of the tax collectors would skim a little off the top and make themselves very wealthy. And the, the Romans understood this and just considered it custom. I mean, they didn't crack down on it and say, don't you skim off. They wanted them to skim because they wanted them to collect more taxes. They were actually very smart about the whole situation. And they said, uh, well, uh, we won't tell them not to skim because, uh, well, they'll just go around and they'll be trying to collect more of a percentage. And they may have even wrote it down. Well, you can skim 10%, which means the more that you collect, the more that... The more that you collect for us, the more that you collect for yourself. And they had to make it a high wage because it was a really it was a type of job that nobody would want. Who would want to be spit on every day because of the job that they had? This was Matthew, and he was hated. And that's why he uh, loved our Lord so much and wanted to write all of these things. Because the Lord Jesus Christ would just get up and chew out all of those people who hated Matthew. And he loved it, and he wrote it down. And he said, all right. It's about time somebody in authority got up and told these freaks they were going to hell. So he started writing it down. So he was a tax collector, and he made a lot of money. But guess what? When the Lord came up and said, follow me, he dropped everything. 
He dropped his high paying job. And no longer is he going to have those plush circumstances that he had always been accustomed to. Now he's going to have to walk around with the Lord. And the Lord, remember, had no place to lay his head. He was, in fact, just about homeless, although people would take care of him and put him into their homes and such as that. But a lot of times they would spend the night out in the, under the trees, and he would go out and pray at night or whatever. And they really never had much shelter or anything a lot of the times. But our Lord didn't care. He had a mission. And so when the Lord said, follow me, he got up and he followed him, dropped everything, left all of that great wealth, really. So then in 9.10, while Jesus, as the honored guest, you see, he was the honored guest when he went to see the prostitutes and the tax collectors. They honored him. Those people honored him, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, everybody that society looked down upon. They honored the Lord. Yet all the religious people despised the Lord. They didn't honor him at all. So while Jesus was reclining at the table, and from the Greek and the Aramaic, this indicates that he was an honored guest. Now, when he reclined at the table, there was a certain style in those days. You must interpret the scripture from the time in which it was written. And it was Roman style. And in the first century, the Middle Eastern meals were eaten while reclining on one side. You would recline at the table on your side. It's hard to describe. It would be as if you were laying on the couch and you have your hand up like this and you have a place for your plate, and you eat like that. It's a very relaxed, relaxed method, something that we would consider not couth, but it's something they did back then, and we would say, don't eat that way. Make sure you have one hand on the table, put your other hand by your side, and eat with a fork, and that's our custom. But they had a custom too, and their custom was when you eat, relax, and sit sideways, and just be comfortable. And that was the Roman style, so it also indicated a relaxed mental attitude. And when the people would go home to eat supper, they wanted to be relaxed, and that's how they did it. And I think it's an excellent way to eat. When you eat, be relaxed, and so was the Lord. So, in, so while Jesus was reclining at the table in his house, many tax collectors and prostitutes came in and ate with Jesus and his disciples. So he's sitting there, really he's minding his own business. But this indicates positive volition from the tax collectors and the prostitutes. He's having dinner, minding his own business. But suddenly uh, people come up and, uh, and so he'd let them in. He was a gentleman. And they would come in and they might be a prostitute. And if you saw one today, they would be wearing something real short up to here. Or what if they didn't have anything else to wear? That was their job. So they walk in like that. And did, what did our Lord do? Did our Lord say, don't you walk in front of me looking like that? No. He said, come in and sit down and let's have dinner. And he also gave them the gospel as well. And then tax collectors, people who were hated by society, would walk in. And Jesus would just say, come on in. It's time for you to hear something. But the fact that they walked up and knocked on the door of our Lord indicated positive volition. They knew their lives sucked. They knew their lives were in a terrible situation. They knew they were sinners. So they said, I need a solution. So they went to the solution. Now the religious people said, I am not a sinner. Not like those people anyway. And the religious people said, I am not in need of a doctor. I don't need this man, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am great as I am. But they weren't. And they were destined for hell. And a lot of these people who were looked down on by society walked in, received the gospel, and believed in Christ, and walked out saved, and yet society still looked down their noses at them. And we'll see this because in 9-11, uh, in, uh, this is what happened. No doubt, uh, once people had been watching the lifestyle of the Lord, and once they saw all the nefarious people start to walk in, 
And they said to themselves, No righteous man like that would hang around with people who act like that. Nobody who thinks they're some great teacher would hang around people who walk into their house who act like this person does. So they curse our Lord by his association with others. And we have a tendency to do the same. And we might say, oh, that person can't be spiritual and hang around with people like that. Well, yes, they can. They just might have a grace attitude. And maybe they know that the person they're hanging around is a stinker, but they say, you know what? They have a sin nature, so do I. So what? Let them hang around. Maybe something will rub off on them. Maybe not. And that's just the way it functions. But uh, this is what the, all the religious people and the legalists want to make an issue out of it. So when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples. By this time, they were about scared of our Lord. They said, oh, we can't trap that man. That man is just too tough and he knows too much and he'll rip me apart by the time I'm finished. So they said, let's go for his disciples. His disciples look stupid anyway. And uh, they had a right to think that because they were just a bit stupid at this time. They grew up later. So when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and prostitutes? You see, they thought they could poison the minds of his students. So they went up to our Lord's students. They didn't go up to our Lord. You see, they knew, I won't mess with his authority, but I'll undermine it by going to his students. They were smart. And they went up to the students thinking they were stupid and said, Hey, have you noticed that uh, your teacher eats with uh, tax collectors and prostitutes? Thinking that that would say, as if they didn't know that. Thinking that somehow they would say, Hmm, you're right. This guy must be a jerk. They thought that they, they would get them to think that way. But what happened next is this. Jesus heard it. They didn't want Jesus to hear it, but Jesus heard it. And when Jesus heard this, Jesus heard criticism. Jesus was alert for criticism too because he knew it was all around him. When Jesus heard this criticism, he said, The doctor goes to the sick, not the healthy. You see, uh, he knows the religious people and their coat of dress and everything. They thought they could be sly, but they dressed like legalists. So he already knew. I mean, even if he didn't have omniscience from his deity, he still would have known. He would have known from discernment because he would have seen these people walk in and talk to the disciples. And he already knew what they were talking about already. He didn't even have to uh, worry about that. He had enough doctrine to know that people nitpick. And he knew they were about to nitpick. So uh, while they're sitting there having their gossip session, our Lord stands up and says, The doctor goes to the sick, not to the healthy. And so he just shut them up because they think of the prostitutes as sick. And they are, but so are they. And they think of the tax collectors as sick. And they are, but so are they. And they're even sicker, but they don't know it. And so they're there and and they're trying to criticize and he's saying, look, I'm coming to the sick, not the healthy. In other words, I'm coming uh, for the people who are prostitutes. I'm coming for the tax collectors, not for you. You think you're healthy. You see, they thought they were healthy. And he said, I'm not coming for you. And he's not because they wouldn't believe in him. And so they will burn and gnash their teeth in eternal fire forever and ever. Because Jesus did not come for them. Even though he'll die as a substitute for them on the cross, and even though every one of their self-righteous sins against him will be judged on the cross, they don't believe in him, so he didn't come for them. He came for these people who know they are sick. And all of us are sick. We all have sin natures. And we, at some point, decided we needed a doctor, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he's, he's saying. But they didn't even get it from that. They're just trying to find a way to rip him apart. And then he keeps on going. And, he keep, and he, 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 not only does he keep on going with them, but he, 
he really starts to pound on them because he's bringing he's about to bring up Old Testament scripture and these people are experts in Old Testament scripture and they thought they could trap the Lord you see now they're getting a bit wary of it because they say you know I, we can't go after him let's go after his students but uh, our Lord knows all the Old Testament scriptures as well. In fact, he created them. Of course he knows them. And in his humanity, he knew them. And in his humanity, he had to go back and learn them. You see, in deity, he knew it already. But when he came to the earth in humanity, our Lord had to grow in grace and in knowledge just as we do. So he went back and learned all of these things in his humanity. And he grew in grace and in knowledge just as we do. And so he, he had been uh, spending a lot of time in the Old Testament scriptures. And then, you see, these scribes and these Pharisees and these hypocrites had always uh, come out and said, let me teach you something concerning the law. And they would go on and teach something concerning the law. And they would say, do not eat pigs. Do not do this. Do not do that. If you don't do that, you're not following the law like we are. And we know how to do it better than you, so you better get with it and follow the law. And that's what they would always teach. So our Lord comes back and, in, in fact, uh, begins to teach like they do, except he's teaching to them like they've been teaching to everyone else. So they're insulted again. They're the ones who should be up teaching. That's what they think. But then... When Jesus says this, you've got to understand it's almost kind of funny because legalists always want to get in your face and say, listen to me, this is the way it is. But then Jesus gets up and says, go and learn what this means. And they're, they're vibrating. This man is teaching me something and they're, they're getting mad. I want mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous. This is self-righteous. I did not come to call the self-righteous, but prostitutes. Oh, he just, uh, you, it's hard for me to explain how he just ripped these people all to shreds. What he's saying is, I did not come to call you self-righteous. I came to call the prostitutes. So you go back and you read your scripture and tell me what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. Because they've always said, you must go out and sacrifice because of this and that and the other. And you must sacrifice to be saved. And you must sacrifice to be forgiven of your sins. So he comes out and says, I want mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, you self-righteous pigs, you've always had no mercy concerning other people. And when you see a prostitute, you want to rip her to shreds. And you want to destroy her. Where's your mercy? That's what he's saying. And he's saying, I, as the Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. And I've come not to save you self-righteous nitwits, but I've come to say prostitutes. Insulting, very insulting, but they needed it. And people like that need such a big kick in the rear end. Well, Jesus gave it to them. He did everything but punch them. He would have never punched them in anger. But he did everything but that with language and ripped them apart with his tongue, already knowing what they were thinking. Tough. Now, he didn't win them over by being sweet. And some of these people who were scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites were shocked enough to come out of it and believe in him. And there were many religious people who believed in Christ. And many who had gossiped about him earlier finally said, he's right, I believe in him. But before that, they gossiped. But they would have never done that if Jesus hadn't laid down the law so harshly. If Jesus hadn't come down and insulted them, they would have went on thinking, I am great just the way I am. And they would have never gotten to look in the mirror at themselves. Jesus Christ, as it were, held up a mirror. He knew what they were. And when he spoke to them, it's as if he held up a mirror and said, you've seen yourself as a prince or a princess. Look at yourself, you're a toad. And some of them saw it. Some of them saw it and got mad and said, no way. And some of them looked up and still saw themselves as a prince, even though they were a toad. But it all had to do with the, what they, their, their own decision. And they had to make a decision. 
And he had to make it clear. And if he hadn't have made it clear, he would have been failing in his job. But our Lord never failed, ever. He was perfect. So that's why he was so tough. Then in 9.14, we begin with the disciples of John. We just had to the tax collectors and to the prostitutes. And now we have something regarding the disciples of John in 9.14. Then John, John's disciples came and asked, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? Then John's disciples came and asked, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but you disciples don't fast? This doesn't mean that John was teaching incorrectly. It means they didn't learn enough. It means that they had taken what they had learned and uh, they, well, they turned it into legalism. So in other words, what they are saying is this. <laughs> what they're saying is, Why are we greater than you? You see how insulting it is? Yet they think they have a right to do that. So they just walk up very pompously and ask a very insulting question. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? In other words, why are, you gr why are we greater than you, Jesus Christ? We make our disciples our students. Disciple means student. And they're going up saying, we make our students fast. You don't make your students fast. We're better than you. So you tell me how you are the Son of God when we're better than you. That's how they're thinking. And then Jesus said to them and gives them a point of doctrine. Cam the wedding guests. We have to know something about what wedding guests were in those days. Today it's done a bit differently. Back then, uh, well, uh, wedding parties went on for a long time. And during this time, the groom showed up at the bride's house. And he had already negotiated the dowry. In other words, he bought the woman from the uh, father. And it was the son-in-law who had to pay. And believe it or not, they still function this way in some places in Africa and in the Middle East. I was talking to a Nigerian the other day for a moment on the Internet. And uh, this Nigerian was my age. I asked him if he was married. He said no, but he was telling me how he's a believer and got into it. And so I directed him to my web page. And he said, and I said, are you married? He said, no, I don't have enough money. And I said, what do you need money for? You know, here we'll just go to a courthouse if you really want to. And it, it's basically just about free. And he said, no, we have to pay a dowry. We have to pay the father for the daughter. And he says, I don't, we're, I'm unemployed. I can't find a job, don't have a job, so I can't get married. It's the same way as it was back then. And during this time, the groom showed up at the bride's house, having already negotiated the dowry, having already paid it, in other words, and picked up her, and he took her to his house or the house of his parents, either one. You see, it was as if he bought her. It was as if he purchased her, and now he's either going to take him to his house, if he has one, or he'll take her to his parents' house. And then what happens next, the groom's friends, usually the groom has a lot of friends, especially if he has enough money to marry. And the groom's friends wait outside until the bride shows up. And then the groom is the host of the party. And the groom has to, uh, well, he has to let everyone stay for the duration of the honeymoon. Now this would be an annoying custom. I think, for us today. We do it differently. The man and woman goes off and bees together, and, and they be together, and they don't have anybody call them. They don't have their parents call them. They don't call their parents. They do what they want. You know what they do? They're consummating the marriage, and that's what they do on their honeymoon. And that's what it's designed for. Not before marriage. If you do it before marriage, you might ruin your marriage. Now, God might grace you out if you make a mistake. And he's graced many people out after making mistakes. But if you're a young person, wait. It might be difficult. You might be tempted by all sorts of things. But you must wait. And they waited in the Old Testament. If they did not wait in the Old Testament and they got caught, they would have been stoned to death. That's a harsh penalty. Thank God we don't have it today because uh, half of America would be dead. But we might be better off if you think about it. 
maybe not. But uh, what I'm telling, well, what happened was our Lord came along and changed the custom. So we don't have to worry about being stoned to death. And the Lord said, I'll take care of these uh, sexual immorality type sins. And so the uh, custom no longer is to be stoned for it. But the principle stands the same. Wait. And they waited till they bought the woman. If they had done it without buying the woman, you know what would have happened? If, if they, would have been, they would have called it rape, or they would have called it something uh, similar to that. And that man who had, uh, had sex with the woman outside of wedlock would then have to buy that woman from the father. And then they would have to consummate. Well, the marriage had already been consummated, but then he would have to buy her. And if he didn't want to, well, then he would be punished severely. So the groom's friend were already at the uh, groom's house. The groom would be the guy, of course, and they're all at his house. And they're waiting for him to go pick up the woman and bring her home. And when he brings her home, they have a party. Now, this was the custom in Israel. Doesn't make it right, but they would drink gobs of wine. And they would drink all night long. They would drink for days straight and have a party just going on and on and on and on. An ongoing party. Didn't last. You know, we have parties and they might last till midnight and everybody goes home. No, they had parties that went on for days. And a lot of times they drank very heavily at these parties. A lot of times they got drunk and got involved in sin too, but that was their culture. I'm just telling you what their culture was like. I'm not telling you it's right. In our culture, we too have uh, something called a reception, but the reception uh, usually only lasts for a while, and the bride and groom go off. But in this case, the bride and groom are there, and everybody raises hell, and that's how they did it. And our Lord, we'll see later when I get to this point of the first miracle. The first miracle is in Luke. It's not in Matthew, but I'm going to bring it out. Because he'll be at one of these types of wedding feasts in which they, he'll be there. And what occurs is that they run out of wine. And his mother is uh, hosting the event, as it were, and she gets worried. And she goes up to our Lord and says, Lord... Or she says, well, she probably called him by his name. And uh, uh, Jesus, we're out of wine. And he looked at her. You see, uh, Jesus was always tough, even with his mother. And it didn't make him a sinner to be tough even with his mother because he was the son of God. And his mother said, son, uh, Jesus, we're running out of wine. He looked at her and said, well, the, why, would, why you make that my problem? It's about what he said. He said, why is this an issue with me? And, and she was freaking out, you see. She was all worried about social life and worried about having all the wine prepared for all the guests. So first of all, he makes a point. But why, does this, why is this an issue of, with me? And then the second thing he does is he gets up from his relaxed position, goes over to a barrel filled with water, and goes, bling, and it turns into wine. And then it's the best wine. And then uh, the people who have been drinking and have a buzz, as it were, they go up and they start to drink this wine. Usually they save the bad wine for last because, well, you, once you get a buzz, you can't taste it. And you don't mind if it tastes worse. You lose your taste buds. And, and so what happens is they start drinking this and they recognize it tastes wonderful. And then, then, and then they go up to the guest and say, why did you save the best wine for last? Everybody puts the best wine first. Because when you first start out, you, your taste buds function better. Everything functions better. <laughs> and then by the time you finish, you, you just don't function very good at all, and you don't even care if you're drinking an ashtray. By some, if you go too far, you don't even care. It numbs you and, and your feelings and all of that, and that's what our, our Lord did that. And you can imagine the legalist then. He's promoting drunkenness. No. He's promoting freedom. People, like, people are going to sin. I mean, people are going to do what they want. And if you're worried that any message from Scripture is going to corrupt young people, if you think that if I get up here and teach exactly what the Word of God has to say concerning things, and you think that will corrupt them, you're fooling yourself. They're going to do the... You can tell them 
because once they get old enough, they're going to make their own choices. And you could tell them till the cows come home, don't touch any type of liquor or alcohol ever. And if they suddenly make that choice, they're going to do it, whether you've said it or not. And I tell you the same thing. Don't do it. You're not old enough to do it. And if you do, you'll destroy your lives. I never drank when I was a teenager. And I saw people who did drink as a teenager, and they flunked out of school a lot of times. And usually they went from alcohol to drugs. Usually it went from, it, usually it went like this. Cigarettes, when they were real young. Then alcohol, they want to experiment with something else. And then drugs, they want to experiment with that. And then they end up as losers. And there was one time, I, I we used to go to class in 10th grade with a very beautiful young lady. Very beautiful. And by the time I got out of high school, she got hopped up on co crack cocaine, and she became so skinny and so ugly you wouldn't know her. And she started out as a babe and ended up as ugly. Drugs got to her. She went with the fast crowd and destroyed her life. She could have been anything. She could have been hired anywhere because she was so beautiful. She probably could have been a model, but she destroyed those chances. They're gone now, not unless she recovered, but it's hard to recover from stuff like that. So don't take, look at me, I done one way over, didn't even know it. Uh, but uh, don't take what I'm teaching when I teach you these things that our Lord did and say, you know what, I can do what I want. No, you can't. You know, these prostitutes came to the Lord's house. These people who were drunkards and prostitutes, they came to the Lord's house and walked in and, and talked to him uh, because they needed help. So we as believers, we have a royal honor code. And we as believers must wake up to the fact that uh, we must live a spiritual life. And that's why you're here tonight instead of doing something else because you think it's important. And I'm glad, because most people don't. And the best thing in the world is to be filled with God, the Holy Spirit, not to be filled with the spirits. That would be alcohol. And uh, you can be happier filled with the spirit. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things. May we come to have grace orientation. May we come to understand what mercy is all about. And may we understand that uh, we're not that great ourselves, that we too have been saved, sinners saved by grace. Therefore, uh, we pray for our president that you will continue to guide him in wisdom and we pray for our country that you will continue to shield us from the attack of the terrorist sword. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.